Okay, so in the first part of this lecture, we're going to focus on uh, on these general uh, concepts about particle absorption, contact angle measurement, and interfacial tension measurement. So let's start with um, discussing how particles absorb at a fluid interfaces and, and, and why do they absorb at an interface. So before um, doing that, we need sort of to look at the origin of what is the, you know, what, it, what drives this vertical trapping of a particle at an interface. And in order to describe this phenomenon, we can think about starting and, and, and comparing the different situation where we have a particle, say a hydrophilic particle, that is initially starting from, uh, from a water suspension. And then this is brought into contact with an oil, and there is an interface between oil and water. And in order to calculate what is the, the trapping energy that keeps the particle at that interface, we need to compare the free energy of this system, particle plus fluids and interface before and after the absorption of the particle at the interface. Um, so in the initial case here, we have essentially two different interfaces. We have the interface between the particle and water, and we have the oil water interface. And as, as you've seen in the lecture notes, associated to each interface, there is an interfacial energy, which is essentially given by the product of the interfacial tension uh, associated to that interface times the area of that interface. So in this initial case, we have that the first interface that we count is the interface composed by the area of the particle, the total surface area of the particle, times the interfacial tension between the particle, the material that the particle is made of, and, and water. And then the second component, the second interface is the oil water interface. And so the interfacial, so the free energy associated to that interface is basically the product of the oil water interface times the area of that interface. Uh, if we now compare this situation with the situation where we have a particle that is absorbed at the interface, this is a particle that is crossing the interface and it's now partly protruding into the oil. We can describe geometrically the position of the particle relative to that interface by a certain angle that is called the contact angle, which we can extract in a way that is analogous to the macroscopic contact angle of a liquid on a solid by using Young's equation. So we define the cosine of the contact angle as the, uh, the, this ratio of interfacial tensions, in particular, the difference between the particle oil and the particle water interfacial tension normalized by the oil water interfacial tension. And this equation essentially defines the mechanical equilibrium of the, of the particle re vertically relative to the, uh, to the interface itself. So when the particle attains a position at the interface corresponding to the contact angle theta, the particle is in mechanical equilibrium uh, with respect to the, to the, to the vertical plane, um, to the vertical direction perpendicular to the plane of the interface. If the contact angle, uh, the contact angle is always measured, let's say, from the water side. So if the contact angle is below 90 degrees, it means that the majority of the particle is actually uh, inside the, uh, the water phase. So we call the particle hydrophilic. If the equator of the particle is sitting right at the interface, so that half of the particle is exposed to the oil and the other half is exposed to the water, this is so-called neutrally wetting situation where the particle likes water and oil uh, equally. And instead, if the majority of the surface of the particle is exposed to the oil, like in the case that is sketched over here, the contact angle is larger than 90 degrees and this corresponds to what is called a hydrophobic particle. So if we take this situation over here now and we compute again the characteristic free energy associated to the, to the existence of interfaces in this case, we have a change compared to the previous case. So now the interfacial energy associated to the part of the particle that is exposed to the water is reduced because we have now that there is a smaller area of the particle that is exposed to the water. But then part of the surface of the particle is now exposed to the oil. So we have an additional term given by the surface area of the particle exposed to the oil times the surface tension of the particle oil um, interface. And then again, we have the oil water uh, interface part, but now because the particle is sitting at the interface, this is actually removing part of the interface. It's some, somewhat cutting a hole in the interface corresponding to the cross-sectional area of the position of the particle at the interface, okay? Um, and so if we now take basically very simple geometrical description for a spherical particle that tells us how the total area of the particle and the areas of the spherical caps corresponding to the uh, various parts of the particle that are exposed to the oil and to the water uh, 
as well as the area of the cross section of the particle at the interface as a function of the contact angle. We can express the difference in, in, in free energy between this case and that case simply by substituting in the expression that I showed you before and some simple uh, uh, mathematical operation basically tell you that for spherical particles, this change in free energy when the particle absorbs at an interface takes up this, uh, this formula over here, this form over here. Um, so, I mean, this is a simple exercise. You can all do it uh, uh, in, in your spare time. If you want, just take the expressions that were derived in the previous slide and plug them into this equation uh, over here. From examining this equation over here, there are important uh, conclusions that we can draw. The first conclusion that we can draw is that there is a minus sign in front over here. And all of the quantities to the right of that minus sign are positive quantities, which basically tells you that there is always an energetic gain by absorbing a particle at an interface, uh, provided that we can define a contact angle based on, on Young's equation that we've seen before. So provided that this uh, relation is verified, which is in, in the vast majority of cases, all materials essentially have a finite contact angle at, at an oil water or an air water interface. So essentially, we take a solid object, we place it to the interface, and by virtue of the fact that we are removing part of a very energetically costly interface between oil and water, and we substitute that high energy interface with a lower energy interface, which is the interface between the particle and, and the second phase, we always reduce the free energy of the system. Okay, so even if the particle by itself is not amphiphilic, it's not a surfactant, still it, 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 is, uh, it is favorable for the particle to be present at the interface. The absorption energy scales with the square of the particle size, so the larger the object, the easier it is uh, for, um, for the objects to be, uh, to be absorbed, or the, the stronger is the binding energy uh, that keeps it there. And the energy is maximized for a contact angle of 90 degrees, which basically maximizes the cross section of the particle at the interface, because that's really what is driving the absorption of the particle to the interface. And now if we plug in some numbers, which are in reference to what I was saying at the beginning of, uh, of this lecture. So if we look at, at what is the, the free energy uh, gain for a particle that has a radius of 10 nanometers, and there's a contact angle of 90 degrees, and this can be achieved, for instance, by modifying chemically the surface of silicon nanoparticles, and we place them at a water toluene interface that has a very characteristic value of, of an oil water surface tension of about um, 30 to 40 millinewtons per meter, then we find that this delta F is about 3000 kT. So even for a 10 nanometer particle, if this is neutrally wetting, once the particle is placed at the interface, removing that particle from an interface costs an energy that is way, way larger than thermal energy. So effectively, we are um, irreversibly trapping the particles at the interface uh, due to, to this mechanism that we have just, uh, just described. Um, so this is the case for a homogeneous particle, okay? And then as you've seen in the lecture notes, what happens now if we place a Janus particle at a fluid interface, okay? And a Janus particle, as you've seen, is a particle that has a contrast in the surface properties across different hemispheres. And typically this contrast of properties across the different hemispheres comes with a contrast in wettability at the interface. And so the question is that here, what is the orientation that a particle takes at the interface? Are we gonna have the hemispheres basically facing um, the one hemisphere facing the water, the other hemisphere facing the oil? Which, inter which hemisphere is going to be up and which hemisphere is going to be down? And is there a possibility basically for the Janus cap to cross um, the interface? So in the lecture notes, you've seen there are some more detailed calculations where people have derived and calculated how this, this, uh, this free energy um, calculation that has been simply derived in these slides for a, spheric, for a homogeneous spherical particle, how that changes if we take into account the Janus character of the particle. And in particular here, we've seen, you've seen the lecture notes that are three specific cases. I mean, there is the case basically where the size of the Janus cap is very small and the majority of the surface of the particle is actually hydrophobic. In this case, the particle will simply take the same contact angle as a homogeneous hydrophobic particle would take. And that is due to the fact that this 
contact angle corresponding to this contact angle, the cross section of the particle at the interface is greater than the cross section corresponding to the Janus boundary. So that is actually energetically favorable to have some of the hydrophobic material exposed to the water in order to maximize this cross section. Okay, so here basically, even though the particle is a small patch, it's a small hydrophilic patch, it essentially behaves as if it was a homogeneous uh, hydrophobic um, particle. The complementary situation is true for a mostly hydrophilic uh, particle, which also sits at a contact angle that corresponds to the contact angle of the hydrophilic part of the particle itself. And these two situations are verified if the ratio, the so-called Janus ratio between the surface area of the two different patches is very large, uh, as well as the fact that the contrast in wettability between the two different surface patches is, it can, is, is small or can be actually quite, uh, quite small. In fact, there can be a situation instead that goes in the middle where actually the Janus ratio starts to be equal to approach one or be equal to one, which is the characteristic case of a 90-90, let's say half and half, 50-50 um, uh, Janus particle, where there is a large contrast in wettability between the two different portions or the two different surface patches. In this case, actually the energetically favorable situation is where the Janus boundary corresponds to the position of the particle at the interface. And, and the contact angle of the particle coincides with the contact with the angle de that defines the position of the cap onto the surface of the particle. Okay? And in this case, the trapping energy of, a gen of such a Janus particle is even further enhanced relative to the calculations that we've seen before by virtue of the contrast in wettability between the two portions of the particle exposed to the two different um, solvents or to, the two dif or to the two different fluids, okay? So you find, so you see in the more detailed calculations in lecture notes, there is no need to go through them in this case, but it's important that we identify the fact that not always Janus particles are lying at an interface in the position which is defined by the cap, but that depends on the contrast in wettability and the size of the, uh, of the patches. So these calculations or these, these considerations that we've made over here, these are all, let's say, based essentially on, uh, on, uh, uh, on the equilibrium position of the particle at, at the interface. So the thermodynamic equilibrium position of the particle at the interface. But now imagine that this Janus particle is sort of freely diffusing around the water phase. And then as it diffuses, it touches the interface and then absorbs to the interface. In this case, we expect essentially that the particle is absorbing to the interface with a random orientation with respect to the interface. And then by the prescription of this thermodynamic equilibrium consideration, we expect that as the particle touches the interface, it slides with respect to the interface and it rotates with respect to the interface in such a way that we realize the minimum energy uh, configuration, okay? And so imagine now that a particle absorbs in this position with a 90 degree cap oriented relative to the interface, then we expect that the particle will rotate within the interface plane in such a way that it takes up the equilibrium configuration that is dictated by the wettability of the different uh, surface patches, okay? So in order for this to happen, we need to make sure that the contact line, which is enveloping, which is uh, surrounding basically the particle at the interface is free to slide um, and to move with respect to the particle. But in fact, if the contact line is spinned, if the contact line is not able to move freely with respect to the surface of the particle, then we can find that as the particle tries to rotate, the contact line is blocked by say surface asperities, surface heterogeneities and cannot move freely. And then this ends up basically trapping the particle into a series of unstable or metastable orientation with respect to the interface. And this is an example of many examples that have been reported in the literature where we essentially see that Janus particles can be oriented with any orientation with respect to the interface. And this is typically happening for thick caps which then correspond to large um, heterogeneities of the surface coverage where the contact line can be easily pinned, the particle can no longer rotate with respect to the interface and then is essentially stuck in this configuration. And I will show you direct evidence and the direct uh, description of the impact that this contact line pinning has
on the motion of active uh, catalytic swimmers at, at an oil water interface. So these were basically some considerations about why colloidal particles are bound to an interface and what is the implication of having a Janus surf surface with respect to their absorption um, to the interface. <clears throat> We now move on to a description of how the contact angle, uh, that, that parameter that we have described before, of a particle at a fluid interface can be, uh, can be measured. So maybe most of you are familiar with the concept of contact angle in, in conjunction to the, say, the contact angle of a liquid droplet that is resting onto a microscopic surface. And again here, sort of Young's equation tells you that this contact angle basically defines the mechanical equilibrium of the surface tension of the three interfaces at the three point contact line in such a way that you, the, you're, you have the mechanical equilibrium in, in the direction parallel uh, to the interface um, itself. And the idea is that we sort of extrapolate this concept where uh, from the microscopic case to the single particle contact angle case, where again, the contact angle over here is described and defined through Young's equation by the mechanical equilibrium of the interfacial tension at the triple, um, at the three phase contact line uh, of the particle that protrudes through the interface, okay? And as we mentioned before, the contact angle is extremely important to define the trapping energy of a particle at an interface, but it is also extremely important in defining many of the other properties of uh, colloidal particles at the fluid interface. For instance, if we think about the dynamics, the motion, even just the passive Brownian motion of a particle at an interface, at an oil water interface, if the viscosity of the oil and the water are different, sort of the, vis the viscous environment that is probed by the particle as the particle is moving, depend on how much of the surface of the particle is exposed to a medium with viscosity one and a medium with viscosity two. At the same time, if the interface itself has some visco vis viscous properties or viscoelastic properties, the contact angle defines the size of the cross-section of the particle at the interface, and therefore it also affects uh, the, the viscous drag that the particle will see at the interface. So even for the passive case, the contact angle strongly affects the drag turn in, in the Brownian motion of, of such a particle at an interface. And as I mentioned in passing at the beginning, then also the contact angle affects interactions between particles at interfaces. In particular, as an example, are capillary interactions at interfaces, but also affects very strongly electrostatic interactions uh, at an interface. In fact, here you see an example of some um, fairly recent work of about you know, 15 years ago, so almost 20 now, where by changing the wettability of the, uh, uh, of the surface of silica particles absorbed at an oil water interface, the balance between capillary interactions and electrostatic interactions can be shifted. And in particular for contact angles that are below 90 degrees, capillary um, forces dominate over electrostatic repulsion. So this causes the aggregation of particles within the interface plane and the formation of such 2D uh, aggregates of particles at an interface. While for particles that are hydrophobic, then hydros um, electrostatic forces, which are dipolar in nature, actually dominate over capillary forces and give rise to the formation of these regular uh, crystalline uh, lattices at the interface. So you see that by simply taking the same particle, same object, same interface, by changing the wettability, we strongly affect uh, their interactions. Moreover, when we go from the definition and the measurement of a contact angle, of a microscopic contact angle, if we transfer that quantity to the micro scale, to the contact angle of individual colloidal particles, these contact angles may not necessarily be the same. And in fact, uh, the surface properties of colloidal particles can be very different from the surfaces of bulk uh, materials because of the different synthetic methods that are used to fabricate those for the different surface functionalities that can emerge throughout the synthesis of colloidal particles, but also in differences in, in, in morphology at the micro and nano scale uh, at the level of, uh, of single particles. And you've already seen previous lectures on AFM that surface roughness and for instance, the implication that surface roughness can have then in, 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 in affecting the absorption of particles at, at fluid interfaces. So for this reason, there's been a development of a large number of, uh, of experimental techniques to measure contact angle of particles at fluid interfaces. And I very broadly divide them into two main groups. The first one that I call macroscopic techniques. And these are techniques where the contact angle of individual particles is inferred 
by a macroscopic measurement of a, let's say, macroscopic interface at which the particles are absorbed. So these are methods that can be reflectivity methods, interferometry methods, or methods that are associated to the compression uh, of, of an interface. And there's been a number of these that have been proposed um, in the literature. And these methods, uh, let's say, work very well, can work also for small particles, but they need to make strong assumptions in the sense that you cannot measure the single particle contact angle. So you have to assume how the monolayer behaves. And one of the main assumptions that is made is that you have a monolayer with a uniform coverage and there is no aggregation, no, let's say, um, heterogeneity of the structure of the monolayer. These assumptions can be very strong. In fact, this is just an example of the many that you can find in the literature where one has small gold nanoparticles capped by a hydrophobic ligand that are suspended at, at a water toluene interface. And here, if you can zoom into the, uh, the interface, you see that this interface is far from being uniform. You have large voids, you have irregular structures, essentially you have a 2D, dense 2D gel structure with local packing defects and, and whatnot, depending on the shape of the particles. So that this is very far away from, let's say, the idealized assumption of having a perfectly uniform uh, monolayer, for instance, with an hexagonal packing. Nonetheless, these techniques uh, work. They give us uh, information on the contact angle for small nanoparticles, because you're not measuring the single particle, you're measuring a macroscopic property. So you can also extract average contact angle for very small particles. So you lose the single particle resolution, or you don't have single particle resolution, but you, you can extract these values for even small uh, nanoparticles. Uh, correspondingly, there are what I call microscopic techniques, which are techniques in which the contact angle of individual particles can be measured. And here there are different ways. Uh, there are te techniques where basically the contact angle of a particle is directly visualized by different kinds of microscopy, for instance, atomic force microscopy, or direct imaging in a fluorescence or a confocal microscope or interferometric techniques. And then there are other techniques where the interface, the particles at the interface are immobilized. And then the contact angle is essentially measured ex situ or afterwards by different kinds uh, of techniques. So the first ones are um, a very, you know, they can be very powerful, but they are essentially limited to fairly large uh, colloidal particles in order to have a resolution that is, uh, that is sufficiently good. So you can measure the contact angle of single particles, but only for fairly uh, large particles. If you're interested in going to smaller particles, these immobilization techniques become quite, uh, quite uh, more useful. And in particular, we have the gel trapping technique of which I will tell you a little bit more in a moment. And there is another technique that has been developed in, in my group called freeze fracture uh, shadow casting a cryo SCM technique that I also tell you a little bit about in a moment as a comparison to the gel trapping technique. Uh, in particular, the gel trapping technique is one of the most used techniques to measure contact angle of single particles at a fluid interface. Here, there is a lot of additional material that we have prepared for you to describe an experiment that allows you to use this technique to measure contact angles. So uh, a postdoc in my group, Dr. Um, Jacopo Vialetto, together with Caroline uh, van Baalen, who's a student in, in, this, uh, in this network, have prepared a video that describes an experiment for a gel trapping technique. And essentially what happens in this case is that you confine the particles at an interface between uh, a hot uh, solution of a gelling agent, a hot aqueous solution of a gelling agent and oil or air. And then you let the system set so that the gel sets and you trap the particles at the interface and you make a replica of the interface and you can measure the contact angle of the particle of individual particles either by SEM or by, uh, by AFM. So as I said, you find a lot more information on this technique in a video that we have uploaded, which describes the protocol for the fabrication of the preparation of samples for gel trapping technique. There is also a written protocol on how these experiments are carried out. And then the first exercise, practical exercise associated to this lecture would actually be for you to analyze AFM data that have been collected after gel trapping technique and to be able to measure contact angle of different kinds of particles from an oil water interface using AFM uh, data produced after the gel trapping technique. In particular here, we have produced um, material for two different groups to work on. So Jacopo has produced, has collected uh, AFM images of uh, silica and polystyrene particles at a water hexadecane interface after gel trapping. 
And then for a second group, uh, he and Caroline have prepared a silica particles with different degrees of hydrophobization. And then you're also asked to measure the contact angle of these particles. So again, here, I refer to the, uh, the experimental protocols for this, and we expect that you will be able to extract contact angle distribution for, for particles, um, of different kinds of particles at an oil water interface using a combination of the gel trapping technique and the uh, an AFM imaging. As a complement to this technique, and I'm just mentioning this because we will use it later or, or I will present it to you later um, during the uh, during the last part of the, during the second part of, of this lecture. Uh, this is a short description of this Fresca, which stands as I said for freeze fracture shadow casting cryo SEM technique. That is a technique that we have developed to essentially push the boundary of the resolution of single particle contact angle um, measurements. Without going into too many details, the technique is based on, on, uh, on the following procedure. We take a very small holder that holds about um, 0.5 microliters of a particle suspension. We put the, the particle suspension inside this custom made uh, copper holder. Then we put on top the oil phase and then we close with another copper plate. So in this case, what we have is a sandwich where we have the two copper plates, water and oil and an interface with particles in the middle. Then we take this sandwich and then we expose it to two jets of liquid propane. And so liquid propane can cool this system down uh, with approximately 10,000, with approximately, excuse me, 1,000 Kelvin per, per second, so that the whole system is frozen within less than a millisecond, and the freezing is so fast that water vitrifies and doesn't crystallize. And in this case, upon vitrification, the vitrified water grabs the particle into place as if they were in the same position where they were in the liquid water interface. At that stage, we keep that frozen sandwich uh, and under cryo condition, and we put it into a machine where under cryo temperature and ultra high vacuum, we fracture that. And essentially the fracture is really mechanically done. And, and the, the sample is mounted onto a table that opens up the sample like a book. Uh, and because we have an interface with particles in between, the plane of the interface acts as a weak fracture plane. So essentially by breaking the sample, we always open the book at the same page, which is the page of the interface, where on one side we have frozen oil, and on the other side we have vitrified water with particles sticking out from the interface. And now the trick for measuring the contact angle comes because with the deposit, we coat the sample with a thin layer of metal in order to make it conductive to be imaged in, in an SEM. Uh, but the coating, instead of being done simply from the top, as you normally do when you coat uh, surfaces, also with the preparation of the Janus particles that you've seen in, in this lecture, instead of coating it from the top, we coat it with a certain angle with respect to the interface. And by doing that, what we have then is that the particles are sticking out of the interface and based on the, on the direction of the metal uh, evaporation, which is tungsten typically, then if the particles are protruding from the interface, the particle that protrudes from the interface is shadowing the deposition of the metal. And essentially the particle works in such a way as, as you know, as the stick in a sundial. And then the shadow of the, of the sun, which is here the, the metal that has been evaporated, and the length of that shadow is directly correlated to the height of the particle from the interface. And then very easily we can measure the contact angle by simple geometrical relations between the radius of the particle and, and the height and the protrusion height of the particle from the interface, which we calculate by measuring the length of the shadow. So this gives us nanometer resolution. This is the resolution of the cryo SEM and a possibility of collecting single particle uh, contact angles. So this is an example of 500 nanometer latex particles at a water decaying interface where for each individual particle, we can measure the radius and we can measure the length of the shadow. So this dark uh, spot that you see over here is a region in the sample where there's a thinner, uh, where basically there is no tungsten, where there's been a shadow of the deposition of the tungsten. And from the measurement of these quantities, then we can extract basically uh, the contact angle, okay? So again, this is a method that is based on immobilizing the particles and measuring the contact angle um, afterwards. And later on, when we talk about catalytically active uh, Janus particles at a fluid interface, I will show you how we use these two different methods to characterize the behavior uh, of our systems. The last part of this first part of the lecture, then I just want to reflect a little bit about how the interfacial tension between two fluids can be measured because that's the other important quantity 
to define uh, the behavior of colors at, uh, at interfaces. Um, just to give you a, a, a very short uh, sort of historical perspective, uh, surface tension, the measurement of surface tension has obviously been around for a very long time. And, and one of the pioneers of the measurements of surface tension is a French physicist called Denuit, um, who in the 20s basically uh, devised this object over here that is called, called the Denuit ring uh, tensiometer to measure the surface tension of, uh, of fluid interfaces. And what he said in the, in the 20s was basically the surface tension was one of the most difficult phenomena to measure. Uh, and he says that even though a great deal of ingenuity has been spent for almost a century in devising accurate techniques, the figures obtained deviate more from each other for the same substance according to different authors than any other constant characterizing the substance. And, and we will see towards the end of this, uh, of this lecture why that's the case. And essentially the case is that surface tension is a quantity is extremely sensitive to the amount of, to the presence of very small amounts of impurities. And so the preparation of the interface uh, is extremely delicate in basically defining the value of the surface tension that you measure. And even though the surface tension between two substances is a thermodynamic quantity that should be fixed for two pure substances, it's almost impossible to get two perfectly pure substances and therefore extract uh, the value of the surface tension uh, without any, any surface impurities. And this will have an implication in the propulsion of particles at interfaces when we use surface tension gradients to ensure the propulsion. So very briefly, we talked, we have presented this into the lecture. So essentially surface tension is a measure of the, uh, of the interfacial uh, energy per unit area of, of a fluid interface, okay? And so this can be described schematically in this well-known sort of Gedanken experiment or even not so, depending if you do it with a soap film, where you have a soap film and you try to stretch the soap film and because stretching the soap film causes an increase of the interfacial area, this costs energy and we need to do work in order to be expanding the surface of the interface. And that work that we do per unit length is exactly uh, the surface tension. And so that if we have a free interface, that interface tends to minimize its, uh, its surface area, okay? And so that is, you know, then, then um, that is at, at the bottom or at the core of the behavior of a fluid interfaces that you're always a drive towards the minimization of the interfacial area by minimizing the, uh, the, by the minimization of the free energy of the interface by minimizing the area of the interface itself. So uh, in order to measure surface tension, the, essentially all of the methods that, that are available to measure surface tension go through the solution of the Young-Laplace equation. So the Young-Laplace equation is the equation that basically defines the mechanical equilibrium of an interface of a given curvature. And it tells you that if you have an interface with a given curvature and you have surface tension that tries to reduce the area of that interface, at some point you have a pressure difference across that interface that basically stabilizes mechanically. And this is called the Laplace pressure. So this equation tells you that the difference in pressure between the inside and the outside of, of an interface is then directly proportional to the surface tension and inversely proportional to the radius of curvature of that interface, okay? And so this R1 and R2 are the two principal radius of curvature of a three-dimensional uh, surface. And this reduced the very simple and well-known case of the Laplace pressure across a spherical droplet or a spherical bubble where R1 and R2 are the same and are the radius of the droplet. So the delta P is equal to twice the surface tension over the radius of the drop. Okay, this is, uh, I hope that everybody uh, has seen this before and this is the Laplace pressure of, of a bubble or a droplet. And this type of, of, of simple description can be made more complicated for different types of geometries, but essentially all of the surface tension measurements uh, apparatus that exist basically refer to the solution of the Young-Laplace equation in the corresponding geometry defined by the, the, the experimental conditions. And in particular for this Denui uh, ring uh, tensiometer, what this does is that you have a ring, a metallic ring, typically made out of platinum so that it can be cleaned and it's uh, chemically inert. Uh, and then you bring it in contact with the interface and then you lift it up. And then by lifting it up, you are deforming the interface and you can calculate the shape of this deformed interface so that you know the radius of curvature of the interface as a function of position. And you basically solve the Young-Laplace equation for that, uh, for, for that specific shape of the interface. 
And at the point at which the, the tensiometer, the ring is just about to detach from the, from the interface, that's the point where you measure the surface tension. And in particular, the force at detachment is, is described by, by this formula where um, H is the height of the, of the interfacial deformation. These functions over here are Bessel functions, which basically describe the three-dimensional shape uh, of the interface. Um, and lambda is a characteristic length scale of, of an interface that is called the capillary length, which is basically given by the ratio of the surface tension divided by, um, by gravity. And so this tells you basically if you have a certain surface tension over which length scale is a deformation of the interface going to propagate. Okay, so this is something that has to do with the stiffness uh, of the of the interface relative to the denf density difference across uh, across the interface itself. So essentially, what I said for the Denuit tensiometer, uh, measuring surface tension corresponds to solving the Young-Laplace equation in this corresponding geometry, um, and all of the tensiometers that exist do the same job, but under different experimental and, and geometrical constraints. What I would like to focus on today is to show you a different method that is used basically to measure surface tension, which is easier to operate in principle uh, and in practice. And this is a surface tension measurement method that is based on uh, extracting surface tension from the shape of droplets or, or bubbles, okay? Here we've just defined the capillary length. It's a characteristic length scale of surface associated to surface tension with an interface. And depending on whether the size of the droplet is significantly smaller than the capillary length or larger than the capillary length, the shape of the droplet will be different, okay? And for droplets that are significantly smaller than the capillary length, surface tension wins over gravity and wins over external forces, which means that the droplets will always have a spherical geometry, while the droplets can be deformed by external forces and deviate from a spherical geometry if they have a size which is larger than the capillary length. And in particular, if we start from the case of small droplets, meaning smaller than the capillary length, this corresponds to a situation where the, there is a dimensionless number that is called the bond number, which defines the ratio between gravitational forces and, and surface tension. If this is smaller, much smaller than one, then surface tension wins. And if we make a droplet at the end of a capillary, then that droplet will have a spherical shape then the Young-Laplace equation is very simple to solve because we have a spherical droplet or a spherical bubble. So delta P, the, the pressure drop, the Laplace pressure across the, the interface will be simply given by twice the surface tension over the radius of the droplet, okay? And so in order to measure the surface tension, what we need to do is to measure the radius of the droplet, but we also need to measure the pressure drop across the droplet. So in this case, by, we can solve by using the Young-Laplace equation, we can extract the surface tension, but we measure, we need to measure the size of the droplet from an image and also use a pressure gauge or a pressure transducer to measure the Laplace pressure. And if we do that, then we can directly extract the surface tension. So this is in principle very simple, but the measurements of the pressure are a little bit more uh, cumbersome than, than just measuring the shape of the droplet itself which is actually what is used in the method that I'm proposing to you in the second uh, set of experiments, which is the so-called pendant drop tensiometry method where the droplet here is larger than the characteristic capillary length of the system so that gravity can actually deform the shape of the droplet. And in this case, when we solve the Young-Laplace equation, in addition to the Laplace pressure uh, across the, the curved interface, the weight of the droplets is also important so that the hydrostatic pressure is playing a role in deforming the shape of the droplet away from a spherical shape into a characteristic, let's say, pear um, shape. And in this case, again, the measurement of the surface tension goes through the solution of the Young-Laplace equation, which is now represented in, in this way. Uh, and the solution of the Young-Laplace equation, basically what it requires, it requires to be able to trace the droplet profile and to relate the local curvature defined by the shape of the droplet, which is extracted from experiments to the value of the surface tension. So in essence, what one does in a pendant drop tensiometry experiments is that you produce a large droplet and then you measure the shape of the droplet under gravity. 
And then by detecting the shape of the droplet, you extract these geometrical parameters as it's been described in, in the lecture notes. And by knowing the density of the fluid and, and gravitational energy, then you can extract the surface tension simply by fitting the shape of the droplet itself. And in fact, this is the second set of exercises I would like you, we have prepared for you together with a postdoc in my group, Dr. Mingan Hu, who's been preparing a video that shows you in practice how a pendant drop tensiometry experiment is carried out. And then he has collected data of droplets of different, um, in, under different conditions. So these are typically water droplets surrounded by hexadecane in the presence of, of certain amount of surfactants in the water, as well as under different degrees of purification of the oil. And then in the second set of exercises, the other two group of students are asked to look at these, um, at these experimental data. And then from a, uh, um, an automated sort of MATLAB script, basically extract the surface tension of the droplet as a function of time under the different circumstances. So again, here we have a written protocol for the experiments. There is a video that explains how the experiments have been prepared. And so that is basically the second set of exercises that is associated to this, uh, to this lecture.